Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And today, hopefully, this will be fun and informative for you because we are talking about one of our favorite subjects. Uh, actually, we never really talk about it, but uh, who doesn't like to talk about booze and maybe some of the things that uh, happen with booze, um, funny or otherwise? Uh, there's a book out called At War with King Alcohol, Debating Drinking and Masculinity in the Civil War by Megan L. Bever. And Megan joins us here today. Hello, Megan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Um, so I got I to gotta ask you, well, first of all, let's talk about you first. You, uh, you're an associate professor at Southern State University, a Kansas native. Mm-hmm. You might be the first Kansas native I've met, although I feel like really? I met another one. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Native, not someone from Kansas, but a native I could be wrong on that. Um, And you got your PhD at the University of Alabama. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, she has the bona fides to uh, to first so that you could trust what she says here. Okay, Um, not that people care about that, but, you know, still, it's it's a little thing that people uh, like to have. So anyway, what made you decide to write about this subject? Um, so I definitely didn't go to grad school thinking that I was going to uh, write a dissertation about alcohol. Right. Um, I did think I was probably going to study the Civil War. Um, that part I, I had known for quite a while, I think. Why? Um, what, so what, the int- what's your interest in the Civil War? Like, how'd you get interested in that? I think it probably like a first grade trip to Gettysburg. Um, so I think okay. like a lot of people, it I got bit with the civil war bug pretty early. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have other interests, but I just kept coming back to the war. Do you remember what, um, what it was exactly that struck your fancy? I think probably the, um, I think I was, I don't think fascinated is the right word. I think I was concerned about sectional divisions. And then, of course, along with that vacation, my mother explained that the sectional divisions were about slavery. Um, and I, it was my first encounter with slavery, and I was horrified by it. Right. Um, and so on that trip, um, we visited multiple sites on that trip. Um, it was a long road trip. But I, I became... Um, yeah, I, I think even then I was concerned about the Confederacy, concerned about disunion and this this notion that a country could could split. Yeah. Um, but I think there was just a little bit. I I don't know. I think I also romanticized it a little bit, and it was probably the first vacation where I was really aware of history and change over time, and I I just became incredibly obsessed in a in a first grade way yeah so. and so really so uh, you didn't know the term in first grade sectional divisions no right so it was just really you couldn't understand how the north fought the south like why right, right yeah right right and then right. and then you you learned that way so yeah, I yeah. think I remember when I was a kid, too, I thought that was odd that the country yeah. was broken up like that and um the slavery thing was explained, slavery thing, the slavery aspect of it was explained to me, but I don't think I was smart enough to really grasp what that meant <laughs> at that age, you know. But as I got older and I started to enjoy the um, benefits of my own freedom, that I, I became more and more repulsed by the thought of owning yeah. someone else. Um, yeah. Sometimes I'm a little slow on the take, you know. <laughs> but okay, so you get into this, and you decide um, uh, you're going to do alcohol. Why? So I actually, so once I got into grad school, I started getting really interested in reform movements, um, and interested in the way that those reform movements seem to respond to really rapid. Um, societal changes. So in the case of the 19th century, you have all of these economic changes and and technological changes that come with kind of that first wave sort of 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 urbanization and um, a little bit of of the formation of factory towns. Um, So I started being interested in those reform movements and I was talking to my advisor about this interest that I thought was taking me away from the war. Um, And he pointed out that there were actually some really interesting intersections and in particular, 
um, he he pointed out that nobody had really looked substantively um, at liquor. Of course, it shows up in all sorts of studies about camp life and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but just a, a one place to find to find some some analysis of liquor didn't really exist. Um, so he suggested it as a way to put these two topics together. Um, so that's how. Okay. That, yeah. And and so how how hard was it to find uh, information on alcohol and the Civil War? Not hard at all. Mm-hmm. Um, it's everywhere, and to I, I would say in one way it's not hard at all. It's it's completely ubiquitous. New p- newspapers talks about talk about it. There are temperance publications. Soldiers write about it constantly. It's all through the official records. So it's really everywhere. The trick to it is that um, archivists haven't always categorize the you know it's not necessarily something people index it's not necessarily something that's pointed out in the finding aid sometimes it is um so it's kind of everywhere and nowhere Mm. um so and i think that's true like of newspapers you would never be able to find it efficiently without the ability to to do a keyword search or something like that in digitized collections not because it's not there it would just take so long um so, so I would say it's not hard to find it at all. It's, it does take some digital tools to kind of separate it out from the other stuff. Um, is it, is it that, um, <clears throat> that it was mentioned a lot in writings is just kind of a matter of fact thing, but no one ever really did a study on it. Is that kind of what you're kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like that might be something that maybe came about later where people became, hmm, I wonder about alcohol use and all that other stuff. And yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're talking to, about chapter six, uh, drinking, duty, and disloyalty. And um, it's it's funny because it, as I was reading it, I, I was struck by the uh, the temperance move it and, uh, and uh, what a bunch of uh, pains in the ass they seem to be. And and really, really dishonest people. I have a thing with activists. I find them to be annoying more than anything. And um, they tend to lie and distort and do, you know, it's like whatever means necessary to achieve our goal, even if we have to lie to people, you know. Yeah. And I don't like that, which is that's part of the reason why I, I have no use for them. But this man was really annoying to read what they what they would do to people. Um, and, and so kind of go into that, because you, you start off uh, in the chapter about Colonel Ellsworth and how yeah. he didn't drink. Right. And and uh, and so his men, you know, followed the example and everything. And then, you know, and he's propped up as this uh, example of uh, of, uh, you know, virtue and everything like that uh, right. after he dies. And um, but it, it, Go, just go into that a little bit and, and explain how that all works. Right. So, so Elmer Ellsworth is a, a soldier of Zuoff, actually, and they they typically have a, re, a reputation for being kind of flashy and mm. rambunctious. But he's a temperance man, and his um, the men who serve under him are temperance folks. And yeah, I really think I think in part it's that he's uh, that that he is sober. That's part of temperance reformers' fascination with him. But also, he dies so early. He goes to take a Confederate flag down at the courthouse in Alexandria, Virginia, and he's so he's right across the, the street, the river from the Capitol, um, and then um, he's killed. Um, so it's one of these really early acts of violence in the war. And I, so I think temperance reformers can run with this as a martyr mm-hmm. and they can basically put their whole message in him. Like this is a guy who served his country. He was completely sober and then he died and we can still say nice things about him because he never did anything horrible like drink whiskey. <laughs> um, and so they, I mean, they, they do little memorials to him. They make tracks about his example. Um, and I think he's supposed to set, he's supposed to set this example for other soldiers um, because reformers are terrified um, that when a bunch of 19 year old men go away to live in camps away from their parents, away from their churches, um, that they're just going to sit around and drink and, they're not 
wrong. Yeah, but, of course, they're 19, <laughs> yeah. Um, they're on a big it, camping trip. Why wouldn't they drink? Right, right. Um, so... <laughs> I don't know, and they're they're worried. Then this will cause the army to to fail, and the nation will be ruined um, because men weren't sober like yeah. Ellsworth. There's on uh, page one thirty nine. There was an interesting uh, quote: "Treason can be punished with death, while drunkenness secures all results of treason and goes unpunished." I yes. mean, see, but that again is the extremist of the activists. Because th- wasn't oh, that yeah. the activist that said that? I believe, right? It was the yeah. temperance movement. They're yeah, they're completely hyperbolic. Oh yeah. my god! And it's like, you know, you, how could you equate the two? You know, but I mean, I understand the point. You know, it, you're 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 still ineffective, perhaps, if you're right. sitting around drinking all the time. Right. But, but before we dive any further into it, in the mid 19th century in the United States, uh, on the eve of war. What was the prevailing attitude in America towards alcohol? Because I mean, I think it's, I don't know the answer to this question, but I suspect it's a lot different than it is today. Um, So when the war started, um, Americans are coming off a a decade, the 1850s, where a lot of states, especially in the North, they experiment with statewide prohibition. So you get that in the first half of the 1850s, they will uh, prohibit the trade in spirits um, by the the second half of the 1850s courts are striking down these prohibition laws they're ineffective they're unconstitutional um, so I would say to the extent that there's like a, a uniform opinion and there's not but if there's like a moderate mainstream opinion it's that licensed legal trade is the way to go mm-hmm. um, so you require licenses you limit how it's sold you you uh, tax when you need to um, and that is more efficient at controlling rampant drunkenness um, than trying to prohibit it. Okay. Um, and then southern states are a little different. They're more rural. They don't have as active a temperance movement. Um, they also have slave codes and black codes. Mm. So if you're thinking about, like in the north, one of the goals is to control workers so they're not drinking on the clock. For Southerners with black codes and slave codes, that really controls that element of access to liquor among the lower rungs. And I don't mean to say that workers and slaves are are the same, but that your control mechanism is functioning the same there. I guess, though, Um, like in the North, if they had an equivalent to a slave, it would be the workers because they didn't they weren't treated very well. I mean, they had freedom, but they weren't treated very well. Right. And there's still that element of social control. Like, we don't want all of these people to drink because then they will upset what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's very much put like. Yeah, it's 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 once again a a rule the elites impose on everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, So so you don't see the prohibition in the southern states before the war. Um, You've got temperance societies, but they're few and far between because it's rural. Um, so that's really, I think, where Americans, where most Americans are coming um, at liquor is is this sort of problem that we can regulate. Mm. Um, and I think temperance reformers are very upset because they think the, that their governments are sanctioning sin, um, <sighs> that by legalizing it, it, you're making a pact basically with the devil of course um so they're very upset um they think that the problem of slavery is distracting everyone from the real sin of intemperance um so that's really i would say you you've got um very loud middle class reform voices trying to basically impose this sober version of americanness on people and you have other americans kind of pushing back thinking that that a moderate regulated cons- consumption can be okay in certain circumstances. So is the is the middle class is the, I mean we're generalizing here for the sake of simplicity yeah. but the middle class is the temperance voice are they yes. kind of secretly supported by the upper class? Because what? Because you know, what? Where? Where does? The, what's their motivate? Like, where's that coming from? Is it? Is it wives sick of their husbands coming home drunk? Or 
Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know that they're... Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.